On August 12th, 1920, Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, was arrested by British Crown forces. He immediately began a hunger strike. 74 days later, he was dead. His death and the hunger strike that led to it is seen as one of the most pivotal events of the Irish War of Independence. News of McSweeney's hunger strike resonated around the world. His treatment at the hands of his captors caused outrage and inflamed the conflict in Ireland. Reaction in Britain forced a re-examination of military and political strategy in Ireland, while his death after 74 days without food later served as a model for further freedom struggles worldwide. No other event during the Irish War of Independence gained as much international media coverage as Maxine's hunger strike. And it's this tremendous paradox at the heart of, of a hunger strike, and particularly Max Sweeney's hunger strike, in that as his body is getting weaker, as his body is breaking down, he's getting stronger. There are people who are talking about Max Sweeney's death um, globally for decades afterwards, and his name is synonymous with kind of patriotic self-sacrifice. I'm Sarah Ann Buckley, and I'm a social historian specialising in Irish history during the early 20th century which is one of the reasons why Terence McSweeney's death while on hunger strike fascinates me. It was a critical moment during the Irish Revolution, a non-violent protest, the ultimate personal sacrifice. But why did his hunger strike resonate so widely? What happens to the mind and the body when it goes without food for so long? And what of the pressure and the medical ethics that influence these kind of events? Using extensive medical notes and personal archives, as well as contemporary science and current medical information, I'm hoping to shine new light on McSweeney's place in history and his legacy. As Terence McSweeney was placed under arrest at Cork City Hall in 1920, Ireland was in the throes of a war of independence. In the wake of the First World War, a guerrilla war was ongoing. The IRA Republican volunteers, backed by the recently formed Dáil Éireann, were entrenched against the British Crown forces most notably in Cork. There's a tremendous violence on both sides. There's a tit-for-tat dynamic between the IRA and the British forces. The Black and Tans have been introduced to the conflict at that time. The auxiliaries are being trained at that time. So you're seeing throughout the country an increasing tension between the Republican movement and its supporters and the Crown forces. And a lot of that uncertainty is really being driven from Cork, especially from Cork City. And that's kind of a center of gravity for the whole struggle nationally. Months previously, in March 1920, McSweeney's predecessor as Lord Mayor of Cork, Tomás McCurtain, was shot dead on his 36th birthday by members of the Royal Irish Constabulary. And that took the conflict in Cork to an entirely different level. The fact that the Crown forces were prepared and willing to murder the sitting Lord Mayor of Cork indicated the levels that the, the conflict was likely to go. Eight days after McCurtain's death, the 41-year-old Max Sweeney took over as Cork's Lord Mayor. He also became head of the Cork No. 1 Brigade of the IRA. Max Sweeney and McCurtain were close friends and shared the same political ideals. Born in Cork City, Max Sweeney was a playwright and writer whose work was often rooted in the struggle for nationalist freedom. One of the founders of the Cork Volunteers, he was elected to the first stall as a Sinn Féin TD in December 1918. McSweeney, on taking over from McCurtain, made it clear he would follow his legacy of defiance. So the Lord Mayor of Cork meant something. It meant that you were a Republican who was going to stand up to the might of the British Empire. Two days before his arrest, a hunger strike by nationalist prisoners began in the men's prison in Cork. They were protesting against being held without trial. Once imprisoned, McSweeney joined them immediately. What drives McSweeney to hunger strike? I think initially he joined uh, the hunger strike out of solidarity with his colleagues in Cork men's prison. Um, but I think as the hunger strike continued, he recognized the political power of his message of defiance. And I think that he was more than willing to continue that 
even if it meant sacrificing his death. He was fully committed, and he had been fully committed for a long time beforehand. Cork's public museum houses a body of rich information about Max Sweeney's hunger strike, including copies of the original medical records his prison doctors made throughout his fast. And it's there that I'm stopping off. Well, this is a, a collection of documents from the National Archives in Kew Gardens in London. It basically is a, a, a detailed record from Max Sweeney's arrest to his death. Probably the most important aspects of it are the day-by-day -day accounts of his hunger strike, uh, especially very harrowing medical details from how he slept, what he looked like, what his temperature was, what his heart rate was, and it shows that it wasn't an easy road and it, it basically the suffering he endured, as well as his family had to endure as they watched him slowly die. As a historian, I deal with the historical record, but to fully understand Terence's hunger strike, we also need to look at the medical and the psychological points of view. For that reason, I'm off to meet two people who can shed more light on these aspects. Dr. Phil Kieran and clinical psychologist Eddie Murphy have examined the original medical records taken during McSweeney's hunger strike. Using modern science and surgical methods, they've modeled out what would have been happening to him, physically and mentally, during the full 74 days he went without food. So what I have here is a collection of documents which basically tell us about Terence's 74 days and his medical condition throughout. And this first document, it tells us about his weight and his height upon entering. As a physician, Phil, I'm guessing these are very significant to you. I think it's really fascinating to be able to see the original medical notes in cases like this because you get a real feel for what the doctors were thinking at the time, as well as some really concrete information. So we can see his height and his weight there, but also that he was in pretty good shape coming into this. I mean, a pulse of 60 in uh, a gentleman of Terence's age would suggest to me that he was quite fit coming into this. We know that his weight on the lower side of normal, but still normal weight. So having these original records from the time is just so interesting to look at. And Phil, what can we expect to happen over the course of a hunger strike? I suppose that what will happen is the physical deterioration of the person on hunger strike. As their body goes through phases of using itself as fuel, different things will start to happen, like the eyes shaking, manufacturing of memories and short-term memory loss. The medical doctors, they're warning Terence about this. They put the pros and cons of this decision-making for Terence and the catastrophic outcome that could happen. But Terence was really focused on his decision. He weighed up the pros and cons. He knew the outcome and he made the decision to go on hunger strike. I think Max Sweeney probably would have calculated the most likely outcome was his release. All the evidence to then would have suggested that this would be the case. The authorities had backed down in the face of a series of hunger strikes in 1920, but because of the worsening situation in Ireland and because prison was becoming useless to the authorities, they changed tactic and they changed strategy. They determined quite early that this time it's going to be different and they are going to make clear to McSweeney and to the other hunger strikers in Cork that this time they will either stop hunger striking or they will starve. There will be no release, the prisoners will have to make a choice. Three days into his hunger strike and already feeling the effects of hunger, Terence McSweeney was forced to stand trial. He was tried by military court-martial on the 16th of August and charged with possession of a police cipher used to decode police messages at the time. Even before the sentence was read, he defiantly proclaimed, I have decided the terms of my own detention, whatever the government may do, I will be free within a month, alive or dead. So, by the trial, Terence has been on hunger strike for three days. What is he experiencing, Phil? I think we can all sympathise with how you feel after even skipping one meal. Uh, you start to get a bit cranky, you start to get hunger pangs, and what's happening in the body is the liver has run through its readily available supply of fuel. The glucose and glycogen has been depleted, and the body has to shift over to a different form of metabolism. 
It can make you more irritable. It can make complex thoughts a little bit more difficult. For someone who is healthy going into it, this would unlikely be getting to a dangerous stage after only three days, but he certainly would have been feeling it. So Eddie, we have these physical effects. By day three, what are the emotional and the psychological effects for Terence? He's determined, he's got focus, he's weighed up the pros and cons, he knows the outcome. He's autonomous and free will in his decision making. So hunger pangs are not gonna stop Terence McSweeney now. It's still incredibly difficult after three days on hunger strike to, to face trial and take on the might of the British Empire though. They take Terence McSweeney out of Cork City Jail, they take him down to Custom House Key in Cork and he's put on board a naval sloop. And at that moment, he leaves Cork City, his native city, for the last time. And at four o'clock in the morning, on the 18th of August, he's handed over to the governor of Brixton Prison. And when he goes inside those walls, the final part of his journey, which would be very long, very painful, and the world would watch it, it begins. After McSweeney was deported, 11 other men remained on hunger strike in Cork. In Brixton Prison, Terence McSweeney, too, was refusing food. When Mary Maxine, his sister, found out that he was lodged in Brixton, she was straight over to London, followed quickly by his wife, Muriel, and later then by Annie, his sister. The women did indeed play an incredibly important role. They set up a rota among the family so that at least one of Muriel, uh, his wife, or Annie or Mary, could have a constant vigil by his bedside. McSweeney's sisters, Mary and Annie, and his wife, Muriel, were dominant figures around his hunger strike and key witnesses to it. McSweeney was orphaned as a young boy and the role of head of the McSweeney household was taken on by his eldest sister, Mary. She provided for him and for his education. The key relationship was with Mary, you know. She was really the big sister, the confidant. She looked on him as not just the brother, but the son she never had in one way. But also, I think she was really taken with the passion he had for the country. Great bond between them, you know. Annie was less outspoken, certainly, more timid, more softly spoken, but equally ardently committed to republicanism. Terence McSweeney had only actually been married for three years at the time of his arrest. He met Muriel Murphy in 1915. She was struck by the fact that he had raven black hair, an olive complexion, and a sort of a, a strong idealism. In June 1918, their daughter, uh, Maura Oak, was born. So when he was arrested, he had a very young family. It was like another famous woman said, there was three of us in the marriage, if you like. There was Muriel and Terence and, and the movement, you know. Hunger strike, I suppose, arrived in Ireland as a modern strategy around 1912, when suffragettes first used it in Irish prisons. Once the suffragettes had introduced it and used it quite successfully, it was adopted by other protesters in Ireland. So Irish labor activists who were jailed during the 1913 lockout used it. Then anti-war protesters like Francis Sheehy Skeffington used it when he was imprisoned in 1915. And then slowly but surely, first as individuals and then later as groups, Irish nationalists began to take it up as a tactic. There's a, a very long tradition of fasting or trusca in Irish history. And we find reference to it in the Larishanicus Moor or ancient Irish law, uh, Breton law tracts. Under the law of distress and compensation, if you were owed money, you could uh, serve a notice of trosca or fasting against your debtor. And what you would do was literally sit outside their door and fast, which would bring dishonor or shame upon your debtor. So it's, it's omnipresent in Irish history. The power of a hunger strike is ultimately to give somebody who is powerless that opportunity to confront somebody who is powerful. No matter what the situation, be it in ancient Ireland, ancient China, or Mount Chai Jail, or in Brixton Prison. And because of the fact that you cannot harm anybody else, and you will die if you die, an entirely innocent victim, therein lies the power of the hunger strike. 
Lawrence McSweeney's hunger strike, more so than any other event during Ireland's War of Independence, generated huge international media attention. Mary, Muriel and Annie were all central to that attention. With access to the world's press in London, they ran a very important PR campaign. These three women really powered this uh, moment of history, if you like. Interviews with the family filled columns of, in newspapers across the world. Mary, obviously, was an incredibly ardent spokesperson for her brother. She would pass on his statements from the prison. She'd give updates about his deteriorating health. Muriel was particularly effective in terms of the PR. She was beautiful and delicate woman. She was a very young mother and she was about to lose her husband. Not a single visit went unreported to the thirsty press who were waiting outside. More and more people are becoming aware of what's happening and we see that manifest in protests in places like, for example, Catalonia, the Basque Country. We see in America that longshoremen in New York are refusing to unload British ships. And we see in places like China, like in Brazil, for example, where 300,000 Catholics send a petition for his immediate release. And the British are seeing this too. The story is so powerful that the British government day by day are finding it more and more difficult to come up with a solution that leaves them in any kind of a powerful uh, situation. The British government at this stage are really caught up in the middle, not just of a military war, but of publicity and propaganda war. They know the publicity that will be generated if they concede to his demands and release him, and yet if they allow him to die on hunger strike, they're going to be lambasted in the international press, not just the English and Irish press. As the story of Terence's hunger strike reverberated across the globe, the British had a crisis on their hands. At the same time, social upheaval at home was growing, nowhere more so than in Terence's beloved Cork. There were still 11 prisoners in Cork Men's Jail who remained on hunger strike. So you had two simultaneous hunger strikes. You had one in Cork Men's Jail of 11 prisoners, and then you had Terence McSweeney, who continued his hunger strike at Brixton Jail in London. There were mass demonstrations every day. The previous month in July, British troops had fired on demonstrators and wounded about 20 or 30 Cork residents, so it was really dangerous to protest. So the way around it was the Republicans organized prayer vigils, rosaries set in Irish, and then you also had periodic masses of intercession where you would have basically the entire city shut down. They were, they were kind of like general strikes. 30,000 city residents signed a petition for his release. That's about 40% of the population. It wasn't just Irish Republican nationalists who supported McSweeney's actions. His hunger strike also attracted support from across all aspects of Irish civic society. This was testament to how much it had fired the public imagination and by extension, increased support for the Republican cause. I have a peep from an interview Muriel did about the experience on day 24. So she says, he was much weaker and more listless and scarcely spoke. He is very far gone now and cannot last much longer, I fear. I think this is exactly what we'd expect to see from someone who has taken no nutrition in 24 days. What's happening inside Terence's body is his muscle mass and his fat reserves are being depleted quite rapidly. So the body will start initially with taking muscle mass away from the large muscles, so his gluteal muscles, his calf and thigh muscles, and particularly the big muscles that run up and down along the spine. One of the reasons he's not able to be up and about rather than lying flat on his back is because his muscles are likely too weak to actually support him in an upright position at this point. His potassium is what I would be worried about now as a doctor. That is going to be off at this point. Depending on how his kidneys are doing, it may be very, very high or it's likely very, very low. And that has the potential to disrupt the electrical system in his heart, which could bring on a sudden death. With the stripping out of the brain of this, uh, the vitamins, it really impacts on concentration, memory, perception, all these really important things about logical decision making. Some days he'll be absolutely coherent, some days he will be remembering things that didn't happen. So it's an interesting time, it's very much in flux at this point. 
I'm here with an incredible portrait of Terence's wife, Muriel McSweeney, by Irish artist John Lavery. And throughout the strike, Muriel, Mary and Annie were seen as a possible weak point by the British government. The British government being desperate to have Terence break his strike. But throughout, these women were steadfast and unwavering in their support for Terence and for his hunger strike. One of the, the worst things they came up against was the constant efforts by the medical officer and the authorities in the prison to persuade them, to persuade him to take some food. It was compounded by the fact that there was food left in the cell to try and entice McSweeney to, to eat. I think the, the temptation to give something to alleviate suffering to your loved one must have been an enormous emotional blackmail to those women. There is both direct and indirect pressure put on all of those women to break his strike. The women were dealing with a wealth of things uh, in London at the time. Of course, all in the constant glare of the spotlight. So day 40 of the hunger strike for McSweeney was very important because he, in a way, outlasted Jesus' 40 days of fasting. And that was regarded as very blasphemous by his critics. The McSweeney family, Mary, Annie and Muriel, had anticipated this criticism and moved quickly to counter it. There was a pre-prepared statement on day 40 of his hunger strike, which spoke about God intervening, his being an agent of God, and that God was giving the English people a longer period of time extending his suffering in order that they could make a decision. Now it's quite clear to everybody that McSweeney is likely to die, and so they are consciously building up a story of the martyrdom that is to arrive and linking him to Christ, and particularly linking him to Christ on day 40, is, is important. There was another theological aspect to McSweeney's hunger strike, though, an aspect that was vigorously contested. Were McSweeney's actions tantamount to suicide? For Catholicism in particular, suicide was a mortal sin. It could never be done. For those critics, a hunger strike, a death by hunger strike was suicide. On the other side, there were very many supporters of McSweeney, not only clergy and ordinary church people, but also bishops and, and cardinals. And they argued that hunger strike was not suicide because death was not intended. There was actually a different intent, which was the achievement of justice. He was a deeply, deeply spiritual and faithful man. In essence, all of his political and nationalistic writings and activities were hugely entwined with his personal Christian faith. His view would have been, it's a just and a proportionate end, which therefore means that it is okay to die by starvation uh, on hunger strike. Science now shows us that a falling body weight clearly impacts on critical thinking. It's a modern psychological concept that I'm keen to discuss with Eddie. But what's really interesting now is brain function and cognitive function has changed because of starvation. And flexibility in thinking is gone. Black and white thinking is what's present. So it's going to be making it much more difficult for Terence McSweeney to reverse his decision. We see in anorexia nervosa that we find it really struggling to work therapeutically with someone with really low body weight. So we need the body weight up to create that flexibility in thinking. And for Terence, with his body weight now, at this particular time, he is now in a stage of inability to focus on long-term outcomes, on to weigh up different options, to look at things flexibly, that's all gone. At the time that McSweeney was in Brixton prison, the idea that his falling body weight could impact his ability to voluntarily come off hunger strike was unknown. His obstinacy was instead blamed on his sister, Mary, who was seen as a hardline Republican. A common view is that Mary just wouldn't countenance McSweeney coming off his hunger strike. 
But how fair is that? There was too much of the, you know, pointing the finger at who was to blame, that she wouldn't let him come off the hunger strike. And I've heard that story myself countless times. But if, from my own perspective, I think it was probably that she was in his corner. She was, if you like, if you like the coach, that when you weakened, she was going to be there to, to strengthen him to stay the course. She didn't want her brother on hunger strike. She didn't even want her brother in jail. So the notion that she would be pushing him to continue to the point of death is, is absolutely ridiculous. It makes no sense. Terence had written for years about the idea that one man can vindicate the idea of freedom. You know, he, he understood fully, better than most people, the idea behind the hunger strike. He recognized the political power of his message of defiance. Um, I think that he had, was at peace with pursuing this to the death in order to pursue what he saw as striking a blow for the Irish independence movement. Phil, what do we learn from the medical records about Terence's experience on day 50? He's now entering the phase where there are involuntary eye movements, there's twitching of his limbs, and really this is a mark that things have come to a, a bad place for Terence. The cause of these is that parts of his brain that control his eye movements and his vision, and also his peripheral movements, are now breaking down. And what's really powerful about that is the terrifying notion of losing your sight, becoming blind. And to lose your sight is such a powerful loss. It's definitely something that would have been a big warning. Very frightening indeed. Lawrence McKeown is a former IRA prisoner who began his own hunger strike in the Mays prison in 1981 as part of the Hate Blocks protest. 10 others, including Bobby Sands, died during these hunger strikes which were undertaken in order to secure political status for prisoners. Lawrence spent 70 days without food. During the hunger strike, the only thing we took was water and salt. I suppose the first thing I felt was cold. Um, one time I had about 10 blankets on me. At a, a later stage, probably around 40 days, the eyesight starts to go seeing double and seeing double very clearly, um, which is a, it's a strange sensation of of looking at things. Uh, and then I didn't move in more to becoming um, just a blurred vision. And then things like lights start to, to annoy you because of fluorescent lights in the, in the cells. I mean, if you think about a time you're tired and then multiply by 100, and mentally, psychologically, emotionally, it's not just physically. Because everybody who died wanted to live. I'd like to read you a description from Muriel of Terence's condition on day 65. He is unable to lift his arms, his fingers jerk convulsively from nervousness, the slightest touch on any part of his body gives the pain. When he wants his bed clothing moved, he signals for assistance with his eyes. It hurts him to touch the cloth with his fingertips. If it wasn't for his eyes and his fingers, one might think that he was dead. Bill, this is incredibly uh, distressing description. This is, this is a, a very vivid description of a body on its last legs. The convulsive moving of his fingertips tells me that the part of his brain that coordinates movement with his hands and legs has now been damaged severely. The jerky movements that they're talking about and the jerky movements that they mentioned with his eyes in different parts of it would also tell me that severe vitamin deficiency, particularly vitamin B1 thiamine, will have caused a part of his brain to degenerate to a point where he's losing control of a lot of functions here. I would be surprised at this point if he wasn't also suffering from the early stages of vitamin C deficiency or scurvy, but I would suspect that he is suffering from complete total body pain at this stage. Yeah, it just says it all, like the slightest touch on any part of his body, exquisite pain. And I didn't think he would want to hurt or harm or share that internal experience with his family members. So to me, he had to also hold that in. Very difficult, very tragic, very sad. Well, actually, on day 67, the medical records do state that there, he is experiencing scurvy. And the suggestion is, and they put it to Terence, that he'll take some lime juice with water. He actually refuses, and his decision is supported by his sisters and by Muriel. And I think 
what they would have seen, the, the visible symptoms of scurvy would be breakdown of the lips and bleeding of the mouth and gums. But that is happening inside his body as well as outside of his body. So like I said, his organs and his internal systems are starting to break down. This would have been an extremely painful time. And lime juice could have corrected that part of it. But I think Terence understood enough at that point to say that he didn't want this to extend his life unnecessarily. There was real questions about how the hell McSweeney was surviving. So this is when you start to get speculation that food was being smuggled in, that there was cheating going on, that actually the whole thing was just an Irish trick. Mary McSweeney went to great trouble to defuse that story because she recognized that it undermined the whole narrative and it took pressure off the British government. It feeds again into the battle for the narrative, you know, the attempts to undermine Terence McSweeney, to undermine the re Republican hunger strike in general. And the medical records that followed from the suggestion that he'd been cheating are here. And but when they undertook tests, there was no tracing of food or sugar, for example, found in his stool sample. Then there was a suggestion that something suspicious was found in his cell. An examination of that revealed that it was soap. So there's no medical records, there's no evidence whatsoever to support the claim by the British that Terence McSweeney had been in any way cheating. Meanwhile, word of another event in Cork reached London. On October 17th, one of the 11 Cork hunger strikers, Michael Fitzgerald, died. McSweeney was 67 days into his own hunger strike at that point. The impact of Fitzgerald's death wasn't lost on McSweeney's wife, Muriel. Muriel made an attempt to, to get the Lord Mayor of Dublin to intervene to end the hunger strike. And I think that's perfectly explainable at a human level. Mary does react to that and stops the Lord Mayor intervening because she understands the need to continue with the hunger strike. The tension inside in that room watching Terence waste away must have been incredible. So it's perfectly reasonable that, you know, tension would develop between the people so close to that experience. More information in the original medical records taken during the hunger strike raises another set of questions. And I'm interested to hear what Phil and Eddie have to say. This is an interesting note. This is a physical examination uh, of Terence McSweeney during his stay at Brixton Prison. Um, and they're talking about findings that would be consistent with tuberculosis or TB infection. Now, I suspect what they're talking about is latent TB infection, which means that at some stage in his life, he would have had TB. This wouldn't have been uncommon at the time and wouldn't represent an immediate risk to any staff looking after him. By highlighting the potential of TB, they were putting in play, as it were, an opportunity not to force feed, because force feeding would have put a significant pressure on the medical staff. This is something that they were very concerned about the medical team. The medical team assigned to Max Sweeney were drawn from the ranks of the British military. A clear conflict of interest existed between duty of care to a patient and an obligation to follow orders. And this manifested itself on the issue of force feeding. Force feeding is a medical procedure, essentially. What that involved was the passing of a tube into the stomach of the prisoner patient then food would be essentially pumped into the stomach through the tube. There was a fear as well, of course, when you're forcibly feeding somebody by tube, that the tube would go into the airways as opposed to into the stomach, and the patient would drown. They would as asphyxiate on the fluid in their lungs. What I would say about the prison doctors is they were very afraid and very concerned that their reputations were going to be damaged by a botched force feeding. It also might put them in risk of being killed by the IRA. Modern medicine still wrestles with the issue of force feeding, which is banned in many countries and is permitted only in very specific circumstances. If they were suffering from a severe mental illness which was treatable, which led them to make that decision, or if they were forced into that decision by another person, they are really the only reasons I can think of to overrule the patient's decision. It's often seen as the rights of the state 
outweigh the rights of the individual because the state have a duty to protect the health and safety of the individual. But I think we're clear in our view as healthcare professionals that the individual's autonomous, their free will supersedes all. I would find it very hard to justify to myself that I could overrule what a person wants done with their body just because the state is pressuring me to do it. And actually, I would feel that that's probably something that applies in this case. I would imagine the doctors looking after Terence McSweeney were coming under a lot of pressure to override his decision and to prevent him dying. The medical team dealing with McSweeney were indeed under duress to keep him alive. As the hunger strike progressed, he was told that should he lapse into unconsciousness, he would be fed without his consent. His sister, Annie, saw directly the effect this had on him. On day 68 then, we know from Annie's diary that Terence is getting distressed and part of this distress is because of the threat of being fed against his will. And it's leading him, Phil, to actual delirium. We do know that in vulnerable patients who are prone to delirium, that any change or stress can trigger a delirium. So yeah, I would agree with her that the delirium, this episode of it, could well have been triggered by that threat. On day 70, Terence was fed for the first time while he was unconscious against his will. When he woke up, he tasted the food and was distraught. Despite his protests and the protests of Muriel, Mary and Annie, this would be the first of a number of times that Terence would be fed against his will. Terence McSweeney is in such a weakened state by the 70th day that they couldn't possibly put tubing down his uh, throat or, or nasal cavity. There were too many risks involved. His heart was weakened. He also had fluid in his lungs. The best that they could do was to give him teaspoonfuls by mouth. And even at that, he woke up in distress and he vomited uh, violently for a period of time. There was no way his body could have absorbed nutrients at that point. He's very distressed, but not only is he very distressed, but his family are very distressed. So the sisters are very distressed. And that has a number of consequences. It leads to confrontations between the sisters and the medical staff in the prison. Annie McSweeney becomes very distraught and distressed at looking at her brother in a state of serious distress. And she has an argument with the medical personnel present. And at that point, they start to ration, I suppose, the visiting time that the family are afforded. I want to show you an extract. It's day 71 and it describes violent vomiting and it's also a description of the effects of feeding Terence against his will. Is it what you'd expect to see, Phil? He is literally one heartbeat away from death at this point. Heartbeat to heartbeat, that could change into a rhythm where there is electrical activity going on, but it's so uncoordinated that it's not pumping blood around his body anymore. And I think this is the description of a man who is on the verge of death. He's 71 days into the hunger strike, and it says that he's not conscious, and he does not have capacity anymore. He can't make a decision now. His, it's those that are around him, his sister and his uh, wife, they're the people that are his decision makers. This is a man on the last legs, unconscious, unable to give uh, any more. Lawrence McKeown, one of the 1981 IRA hunger strikers, has personal experience of the later stages of a long hunger strike. After 70 days without food, his mother intervened. On the 69th day, I don't, I don't recall it, apparently I was still speaking, but I was getting confused about who I was speaking to or what I was saying. And then on the 70th day, which was a Sunday, uh, apparently what the doctor does is examine you and check all your reflexes, and there's no movement at all. And at that stage, he pronounces that you're in a deep coma and won't be coming around again or speaking again, whatever. And power of attorney then shifted to my mother and she authorised medical intervention. I uh, regained consciousness within the intensive care unit in the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. 
when I did come round, I could hear a voice. It was a female voice. It was a nurse. And it was first name, so it was Lawrence. It wasn't 454 McEwen. It was Lawrence, uh, you're in the Royal Victoria Hospital. There was a touch on the arm, which was a gentle touch as well. Because even if the medical screws weren't brutal, it was still a masculine prison touch, which is a bit different. I never held it because my mother uh, neither did any of our prisoners. We had, uh, thankfully, the, the majority realised that our families were caught in the most tragic situation. My mother died less than two years after the hunger strike, and I would say it, it took a massive toll on her. Um, the later years I've looked from, from being released, to able to look back at photographs that were taken at sort of the, probably around 1980, and then ones were in 82, and I can see very clearly the, um, the impact that it had on her. McSweeney's family was also suffering at this stage. An end was imminent. It comes to a stage whereby Muriel, his wife, is the only one who's allowed to be with him in the final days and hours. The sisters are allowed in, but only for short periods of time. Eventually, on the, the day uh, of his death, they weren't allowed near him at all. They never got beyond the prison wall. At 5.30 a.m. on Monday, the 25th of October, Terence McSweeney died. He was 41 years of age, and he was on the 74th day of his hunger strike. On the same day, another of the hunger strikers in Cork Prison, Joseph Murphy, also died. The reaction to both deaths was instant. The fallout from McSweeney's death in particular was enormous and far-reaching. The reaction was immediate. Huge crowds gathered outside the prison. And here at home in Cork, there was massive crowds outside City Hall once the news broke. The city went into mourning, effectively. People wore uh, rosettes, black armbands. Uh, students walked out of university in protest. There were protests actually internationally as well. There was protests in New York. The world, who had been following this for, for so long, was shaken by the actual death. These are a collection of extracts of letters and telegrams of condolences that City Hall, Cork City Hall, received after the death of Terence McSweeney from around Ireland, the UK, Europe, further afield. Some are very personal, some are from trade unions and other political groups. But what's important was is that City Hall realised the importance of collecting these telegrams to highlight the international attention that McSweeney's death had, had garnered. This is another incredible painting by John Lavery, and it depicts the first of McSweeney's three funerals, this one being in St George's Cathedral, Southwark in London. And while Muriel could not be at the funeral because she was suffering from exhaustion, I think that the huge crowds that gathered outside the cathedral are really a testament to how much McSweeney's case had struck a chord with the British public. The body was initially taken from Brixton Prison to Southwark Cathedral in London, and there were massive attendance at a memorial mass, and then his body was processed from there to the train station, and about a quarter of a million people lined the route including a lot of people who were not Irish nationals. Now the plan was that the coffin would be brought by steamship from Hollyhead to Kingstown, Dunleary, where there would be a procession and a funeral first in Dublin, where the Sinn Féin leaders were hoping to generate even more publicity, but unknown to the family who were accompanying the coffin by train to Hollyhead, the British government had given orders that this wasn't to be allowed to happen under no circumstances that they want two funerals and the double publicity. So they arranged that when the coffin arrived by train at Hollyhead, it would instead be taken by another steamship directly by sea to Cork. 
The family learned of this. They actually refused to surrender the body and the coffin. They linked arms and they were kind of beaten off of the coffin. It was really remarkable scenes. And it was really kind of visceral, the, 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 the idea of stealing this body. Eventually, the British authorities got their way and the coffin was removed and put on a steamship to Cork. Meanwhile, the family decided to go on to, to Dublin Annie and Mary McSweeney took part in this funeral without a body that happened anyway in Dublin, which again gave the Republican cause another big spectacle. The family went from there then to Cork, where there was that final very poignant scenes in Cork. Thousands upon thousands of people filed past the remains in an open casket where they were shocked to see the emaciated corpse of their once uh, robust Lord Mayor. The funeral was originally going to be massive, but the government had issued instructions that it couldn't be more than 100 people in the cortege, and they threatened to fire into the funeral party um, should it uh, exceed those limitations. The British troops were lined along the route, armored cars followed in, and they actually were training machine guns on civilians. It's a pretty powerful indictment of the British government that you can't allow a city to mourn its mayor in a way that it deems fitting. Uh, and again, that just added to the kind of the sense of moral outrage around the whole event. On the night of his funeral on the 31st of October 1920, there's 52 RIC officers attacked throughout the entire country. Six are killed, eight are wounded, and five are taken prisoners. Now that's the night of his funeral. Within weeks, the conflict dramatically escalated. You had the execution of Kevin Barry, Bloody Sunday, uh, the Kilmichael ambush, the burning of Cork. All these dramatic moments uh, follow just within weeks of uh, Terence McSweeney's death. The six months that follow, right leading up to the, the Anglo-Irish truce of July 1921, are the bloodiest of the entire conflict. It constitutes 70% of all deaths that occurred across the two and a half year period. I think if you look at the totality of the Irish War of Independence and the British government's determination to pursue uh, a policy of coercion, the single most important moment was the hunger strike in Cork Men's Jail and Brixton Prison. And I think that that really undermined British political will, and it really set the stage for uh, a peaceful settlement, uh, which was gonna be the Anglo-Irish Treaty, uh, which would establish the Irish Free State. Terence McSweeney's legacy and the impact of his hunger strike wasn't just felt in Ireland. Terence McSweeney's hunger strike becomes a model for all kinds of global dissidents, Ho Chi Minh, Nelson Mandela, but especially the Indian nationalists. Mahatma Gandhi undertakes a series of hunger strikes in the 1930s, and he's very much influenced, and he sees the potential of a, a hunger strike that's disciplined, um, that's well thought out. There was something really moving about watching somebody slowly die for a principle supported by his family, supported by a priest in his church, and willing to die for principles in a really public fashion. The Basque country, Catalonia, Palestine, there have been many freedom struggles throughout the world who have drawn and referenced Maxvini as their uh, symbol of inspiration, all surrounding that very simple idea that freedom is so important that some people are willing to place their life on the line for it. An incredible story had come to an extraordinary end. The actions of one man from Cork had generated a reaction all over the world. But perhaps it is most fitting that we end this story in the words of Max Sweeney himself. It is not those who inflict the most but those that suffer the most who will conquer. <laughs>
Miles Dungan looks at superstitions surrounding diseases in the 17th and 18th centuries and the oral history collection of Unshin McGowan on the History Show Sunday just after 6 on RTE Radio 1. Next tonight here on RTE Television, one that will definitely go into the history books. Thanks for the